see. Okay. Welcome everyone. I see some people trickling in already. I'll give it a few minutes and then we'll get started. Maybe one minute and we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Okay, I see people coming in, so I will beat around the bush. I want to leave time for Q&A. So welcome to the Solar App and Calab webinar that LGSEC is hosting with um, the California Solar and Storage Association, the National Renewable um, Energy Lab, and then um, the California Energy Commission, Understanding Solar Permitting Solutions and California's Program to Assist Local Government Adoption. I'm going to quickly pass it on to our moderator, Ooh. Damian Hardman Saldana. He is LGSEC's board co-chair, and he's also a senior planner with the, with the County of Contra Costa. Um, I'm a little bit sick, so I'll just let Damian take it over from here. So welcome, Damian, and welcome to everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Gabby, and appreciate that. And I just want to welcome everyone um, to this event. I think you're going to, hopefully you'll find it uh, valuable. And so we just wanted to go over the agenda and our overview, what, what we're going to be covering today. And, you know, first I'll go over some uh, welcome and some housekeeping items. And then um, the Cal App overview will be presented by the California Energy Commission. And the solar, we'll be doing the solar app overview. And that is going to be presented to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And then we're going to talk about the solar app affordability benefits. And then we're going to have um, audience Q&A and some closing. And so we'll do uh, some of that as well. Hopefully you have lots of questions and we're excited. Next slide. Okay, so uh, those of you who are not familiar with Zoom or if it's been a while, um, you know, make sure you have your microphone um, mute, muted for the event. Unless you, you wanna speak, you can unmute. Um, and then the chat, please use the chat function. Uh, to to reach out to LGSEC staff if you encounter technical issues, but please use the Q&A function uh, box to submit your questions, which is something I'll be tracking during the event. Next slide. All right. And so, I, you know, before we get started, I did want to do a quick intro of our panel speakers for today. And first we have Lucio Hernandez. Lucio Hernandez is an energy commission specialist in the reliability, renewable energy and decarbonization incentives division of the California Energy Commission, CEC. He joined the CEC as, staff, as a staff member in 2016 and currently works on multiple grant and incentive programs supporting renewable energy projects throughout California. Lucio received a bachelor's of arts in mathematics from California State University of Sacramento. Our, our other uh, panel speaker is Patrick Gibbs. Patrick is a researcher with the Community Energy Transitions Group in the Accelerated Deployment and Decision Support Center. His work focuses on assisting communities in planning their transition to clean energy across uh, NREL's different technical assistance programs. His core activities include research analysis and support of community energy planning to assist in community-based energy decisions. And then our other panel speaker is Benjamin Davis. Ben manages the California Solar and Storage Association's codes and standards and permitting campaigns to lower soft costs and increase safety. His portfolio has included AB 1124 that prevents building departments from blocking the construction of up, up to code solar carports, SB 379 that requires cities and counties adopt solar app plus to automate residential solar permitting and AB 1208 that prohibits local governments from taxing property solar production. Ben also has advised the California Energy Commission on landmark solar and storage mandates for new construction, was a primary author of the solar battery provisions in the California Residential Code, among other things. He sits on the, on the board of the solar at Plus Foundation and Steering Committee for the Sustainable Energy Action Committee. Ben has been with Cal SSA since 2019. Prior, he conducted research for solar and clean energy campaigns across the country. He's a native of Santa Barbara, graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, and lives in Sacramento. 
And I'll pass it on. Next slide. Okay. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me all okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine, Lucio. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. I will give an overview of the California Automated Permit Processing Program, also known as CalApp. My name is Lucio Hernandez, and I'm one of the team members that administers this program. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here's a quick look at what I'm covering today. Uh, most of this focuses on the CalApp program, and so uh, I will include information about the Senate Bill 379 uh, annual recording, which is somewhat related. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, first, let's start with a high-level overview of the CalApp program. CalApp is a grant program de developed and administered at the Energy Commission that was established with funding from the 2021 Budget Act. This bill provided $20 million with a mandate to support a grant program and for cities and counties to establish online solar permitting. Funding is available to all incorporated cities and counties across the state. The deadline to apply is May 1st, 2023, while funding lasts. The application is very short and intended to be simple for any authorized representative of a city or county to complete and submit. Uh, more information, including access to the application form, is available on the program webpage displayed here. Funds are reserved on a uh, first-come, first-served basis following approval of a complete application. Uh, reimbursement will be paid for eligible costs uh, after completion of all grant activities and proof of adoption of an online solar premium system. Although the application deadline is around the corner on May 1st, 2023, it should be noted that grant funds uh, do not need to be liquidated until 2027. So there's plenty of time to complete uh, the grant task after being awarded funding. Uh, next slide. Uh, the grant program that uh, we developed through the public process and released in June of last year boils down to two options. Option one is to adopt Solar App Plus, or the second option is to adopt a software that is functionally equi equivalent to Solar App Plus, um, as defined by the um, list shown here on this slide. This list is pulled directly from our application form. As you might already know, Solar Plus is a web-based uh, portal developed by NRA, uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which will be covered uh, later on by the NREL team after uh, my overview. Uh, for those choosing to go with an alternative system, please note that each required feature will be verified prior to issuing payment. Next slide. Uh, we created and released a streamlined and simple application intended to facilitate easy participation. The process starts with a representative from the applying jurisdiction completing and submitting the application. Um, once uh, funding is reserved, the applicant will complete all activities to adopt an online automated permitting tool such as Solar Plus. Uh, upon full adoption and completion of all related activities, the awardee can then invoice the CEC for reimbursement of the eligible costs. The CEC will verify successful uh, adoption of the system. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's a quick look at the funding structure for CalApp. The grant amount that we reserve for you is predetermined based on the population size. The grant award uh, sizes are what we reserve for your jurisdiction when the application is approved, and it is the maximum funding amount. The actual amount paid will be based on the actu actual cost encountered during the term of the grant and must be supported by proof of eligible expenditures in the final invoice documentation. Uh, next slide. And here's an overview of what we can and cannot reimburse. This is a summary and a complete list um, can be found in our solicitation manual. 
We anticipate most applicants will use the majority of the funding to reimburse staff resource costs for the integration into the um, jurisdiction system. We also allow reimbursement for other costs such as training and education for staff and local installers. The most important thing to note for unallowable expen uh, expenses is that we cannot reimburse for any activities that occur outside of the grant agreement term. This means prior to the official date of the grant execution. If you already uh, submitted a started adopting a platform, we can only pay for activities that occur once the grant is fully signed and executed. The initial um, approval of the application does not constitute an executed grant. For jurisdictions that already adopted a platform such as Solar Plus, there may still be opportunities to participate. For example, we provided funding for maintenance, which may include adding support for energy storage paired with solar energy system permitting to the existing platform. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's a quick look at our application, which shows uh, all four pages. We accept application submittals electronically via email. Our application form is accessible from our program web, web page and um, the uh, the solicitation manual should be reviewed before applying. Applications will be reviewed and processed on a non-competitive first come first serve basis, while funding lasts until our the submittal deadline. As of now, there is about uh, a little less than thirteen million remaining, and we uh, post an updated award list on our website roughly once a month showing all approved jurisdictions and remaining funding amounts. Uh, next slide. At this point, I will uh, begin uh, a quick review of, of the Senate Bill 379. It's uh, worth noting the, that CalOp funds can be used to comply with the SB 379. Uh, next slide. First, let's start with an overview of the bill itself. Senate Bill 379 was written by Senator uh, Weiner and was signed into uh, by the governor in mid-September of 2022. The law went into effect in January and requires most California cities and counties to implement an online automated permitting platform such as Solar App Plus. Uh, this bill impacts most cities and counties in California and compliance is expected to be achieved by September 30th, 2023 for larger cities and counties and September 30th, 2024 for smaller cities. The bill assigns the Energy Commission to adopt guidelines related to annual reporting and to facilitate this reporting. We are currently in the process of, of doing this now. Next slide. Um, Exemptions to SB 379 apply based on population sizes. For cities, those with a population less than 5,000 are exempt. For counties, any with a population less than 150,000 are exempt. And we have a quick example. Sorry about that, the light just went off. <laughs> uh, here's a quick example of the city of uh, Truckee and which is not exempt with a population of six, around 16,000, but the uh, Nevada County is exempt with a population of nine, around 97,000. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. As noted in the bill, there are compliance deadlines for jurisdictions to satisfy the requirements of SB 379. These must be met by September 30th of 2023 for cities with a population greater than 50,000 and cities with a population of less than 50,000 have an additional year until September 30th, 2024 to meet the requirements. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Senate Bill 379 sets requirements for the Energy Commission to adopt guidelines pertaining to annual reporting on the number of permits issues issued in the relevant character, characteristics of those systems. 
We published draft guidelines in December and held a one month comment period. We're currently reviewing our proposed final guidelines and intend to bring this to the an Energy Commission business meeting for adoption next month. What I'm covering here are just proposals until these guidelines are adopted by the Energy Commission. Uh, to submit data to the CEC, we plan on utilizing an online data portal maintained by the Energy Commission, which should be accessible through our SB 379 webpage. Following implementation, jurisdictions shall submit data covering the most recent calendar year from January 1st to December 31st. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have a summary of the staff proposal for data that we will collect based on our latest proposed guidelines. Our intent is to collect relevant data pursuant to SB 379, which can be quickly compiled and submitted by reporting jurisdictions. These reporting requirements apply to all non-exempt uh, jurisdictions, meaning cities above 5,000 in population and counties above 150,000 in population, regardless of whether you participate in the CALAP program. Next slide. Uh, as noted earlier, the application is now available. We've already received and approved over 100 applications worth a little over 7 million in funding. Um, these, this wraps up um, our program overview and here is some key information to stay informed and to follow up with any uh, other questions related to this program. Thank you. Thank you guys. Um, yeah, thank you, Lucia. Uh, really appreciate that presentation. We're going to kick it off next to Pat, next for Patrick Gibbs. Patrick, go for it. <laughs> thank you, Damien. Um, hi guys. Thank you for joining us today uh, to learn more about CalApp and SolarApp. Um, SolarApp stands for the Solar Automated Permitting Process. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab is one of 17 national labs founded and funded by the United States Department of Energy to tackle the critical scientific challenges of our time. Specifically, NREL focuses on finding creative answers to today's energy challenges and has decades of focused leadership in clean energy research, deployment, and development. For Solar App Plus, NRL has collaborated with a team of experts shown on the slide here. Uh, to develop an online permitting platform that will automate rooftop solar plan review and produce code compliant approvals instantly. We have worked with solar industry gr groups such code bodies like the ICC, the building safety community, environmental organizations, and of course local governments to develop solar. App. The platform is free to adopt and we consider it a driver of economic development for jurisdictions. Data shows that economic growth compounds once permitting moves to an all online system and grows even more once the permitting process incorporates instant permit approval. As an example, once the city of San Jose took the step to automate PV approvals, they experienced a six-fold increase in growth. The resulting economic growth from an automated permitting creates an infusion of local resources and generates a greater amount of government revenue for less effort. Additionally, Solar App is meant to make online automated permit processing more accessible. Expanding no such process, no touch processing can be very important in continuing installations during times like COVID, when remote operations became essential. Uh, next slide, please. Given conversations that we've had with uh, jurisdictions, we've noticed a trend that rooftop solar projects tend to have very consistent designs. Residential rooftop PV projects with one module and one inverter are common, easy to approve, and often take no more than an hour to review. But because of the sheer volume of applications, they often sit in a queue before they get reviewed. Because of the commonalities across designs, we estimate that Solar App can cover 70 to 80% of the permits submitted for solar and approve them without any delay. 
This slide summarizes the systems that are compatible with SolarApp at this time. Currently, SolarApp is focused on residential PV and is compatible with the 2017 and 2020 NEC codes and the 2018 and 2021 I codes. And of course, in California, we are compliant with Title 24. The platform was recently updated to process main panel upgrades. Also displayed here are the features that we are planning to include in SolarApp. SolarApp will be able to instantly improve applications for PV plus storage projects, which we are currently piloting in many jurisdictions. SolarApp will be continuously updated based on new codes, and we will continue to add new technologies to our eligibility portfolio. In the future, SolarApp will be able to improve applications for EV, EV chargers and more. Next slide, please. There has been abundance of interest in Solar App Plus. As current, we have 12 jurisdictions that have fully adopted, including Pleasant Hill, San Ramon, Menifee, Simi Valley, Stockton, Sonoma County, uh, and Benicia in California, and then Tucson and Pima County in Arizona. We also have quite a few jurisdictions running pilots, including Modesto, Richmond, Beaumont, and many more. We also have many jurisdictions that are working through the onboarding process and in discussions about launching a pilot. Although Solar App is not yet adopted in all states, there has been significant interest from installers and jurisdictions who want to use the tool across the country. Our next slide, please. To give some insight into the impact Solar App Plus can have for jurisdictions, we've highlighted a brief case study from Tucson, who's one of the first jurisdictions to pilot and adopt Solar App. Since piloting, issue, Tucson has issued over 1,800 permits using Solar App Plus, which has allowed over 14.2 megawatts of residential solar to be installed locally. Utilizing Solar App has allowed their permit process to go from four weeks to instant and has saved permitting and building staff over 1,800 hours. Next slide, please. This slide displays some of the some results from all of the communities that have been piloting with Solar App. To date, Solar App Plus has issued over 6,700 permits in those communities, which include over 1,400 revisions, and we've issued more than 500 permits through our PV Plus storage pilot. Among those communities, we have seen no time added to inspections of PV systems in the field. And on the topic of inspections, projects permitted through Solar App Plus were installed and inspected 12 days faster than projects using our traditional process. All of this was done through Solar App Plus's ability to provide instantaneous review, reducing average permit review time to less than a day and saving AHJ staff over 6,000 hours. You can also see the median business days for permit review all less than one day. This is especially advantageous if you are a community looking to achieve SolSmart Gold designation. Next slide, please. Now we'll discuss what Solar App actually does. Uh, this slide gives a high level overview of the process that contractors would follow in Solar App. First, the installer inputs a the project information and spends 15 minutes moving through fire, structural, electrical, and workers' compensation questions. There are about 50 questions in total. Across the forms, our system is automating compliance checks that you and your staff would otherwise have to do visually. Second, Solar App Plus runs those compliance checks. If the installer inputs anything not compliant, the system will give them live feedback, guiding them towards a compliant answer. Because it's automated, it can quickly catch code issues, typos, and errors. It is designed to be responsive. So we'll instantly return corrections and provide guidance for getting a correct answer in an input field. This eases the process that would otherwise require a back and forth between your office and the installer. Because of this, Solar App can limit the amount of questions a jurisdiction gets on basic applications, especially from new installers. This will allow your permit technicians to focus their efforts on complicated permits rather than the easy typical systems. Third, if a contractor completes a compliant application, they will pay the Solar App administrative fee and your permitting fee. Once payment is complete, the permit is instantly issued with the inspection checklist and other content for your inspection team to verify in this field. Again, this is through a no-touch process that allows for 24-7 instant permitting. Next slide, please. 
Solar app is adaptable and we offer two different options to best meet the needs of the jurisdiction. The first option is the standalone model. This is for jurisdictions who currently accept applications via email, mail, or in person. The standalone model starts with the installer inputting their project and paying the $25 administrative fee. The contractor then would pay your city or county fees in Solar App using Stripe. The project approval documents are stored in Solar App for easy future access. And finally, the permit gets issued instantly. And all permit inspection documents are sent both to the installer and the jurisdiction. The integration model is for jurisdictions already using some type of online permitting portal such as Excella or Tyler Intergov or eTracking. This method also starts with installers inputting their project and paying our $25 administrative fee. They re then receive approval documents for the AHJ system. The installer would then be directed back to your system where they would upload approval documents for the project directly into your government software system and paying any city or county permitting fees, and then your system would instantly issue the permit. Next slide, please. If moving forward with adoption is something that interests you, this slide walks exactly through what that process looks like. Uh, it is a four-step process. First, we need to select the right app model of solar app for your jurisdiction, either the integration or the standalone versions reviewed on the previous slide. The next step would to be input local settings. These aspects are such as permitting contacts, wind speed, snow load, temperature variables, model code years, and a few other pieces and our team is more than happy to help you with this step. Next would be to set up an instant workflow. If you're moving with, forward with the standalone model, this step would include setting up your permit payments and solar app using Stripe. If you're moving forward with the integration model, you would then need to set up an instant workflow in your government software. And finally, launch. This would involve inviting one to three installers to use solar app for permitting and running a pilot if needed. And then after running our pilot, we'd be able to open up solar app to all installers in your area. Uh, next slide. Oh, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, um, Patrick. Really appreciate that. I, I do want to acknowledge there are several questions that are coming in. We're going to hold all questions and we'll answer them live. So we'll, we have one more presentation. And we're going to move forward with the solar solar app benefits with um, Benjamin Davis. Great, thanks, and hello everyone. Uh, we are really excited about uh, solar app. We see it as a game changer in terms of getting more solar installed on more roofs throughout California. Uh, so, solar app will lead to two types of benefits. Just big picture, one solar app allow solar to be installed faster. And then two, solar app makes solar cheaper. And the combination of these two benefits is that more people end up going solar, especially low income homes. So next slide, please. So this sl slide shows the conventional permitting times for residential solar systems. So you know, permitting not via solar app, um, you can, See, text is a little small, but you can see the median permitting time for solar only systems is 13 days. The median permitting time for solar and storage systems is 19 days. And that's not only too long, but it's indicative of a bigger problem, which is what's the time and the resources it's taking solar companies and jurisdictions to do the permitting. And that also drives up costs. And from the industry point of view, we are especially concerned about the bars to the right half of the graph, right? One in 10 solar systems, it takes more than two months to permit. Uh, one in seven uh, solar and storage systems takes more than two months to permit. And one reason that this is alarming is that homeowners nationwide, they cancel approximately 10% of projects. Uh, and National Renewable Energy Laboratory, you know, Patrick was, was just a speaker from them. They conducted a, a study and installers cited the permitting process and associated delays as the top reason for cancellations. And with solar app, the permitting delays, they are eliminated and fewer projects are canceled, which of course results in more solar being installed. 
And then additionally, every time a project is canceled, the installer has already sunk $1,000, $2,000, sometimes $5,000 into that project. And then those costs are passed on to other customers, raising the cost of solar for everyone else. Uh, so um, let's look at the costs. Next slide, please. So in the last decade, the cost of residential solar systems in the United States has dropped 64%, which is incredible. That drop is largely due to reduced costs of solar panels and other hardware and increased efficiency of the hardware. The soft costs, right, those are costs other than the hardware and, and installation labor they've stayed relatively constant. And while other countries have reduced those soft costs, they've remained really high in the United States, especially in California, that's the orange bar on the left. And that results in solar carrying a higher price tag here than in the rest of the world. So we are very excited about solar app because by reducing the costs of permitting, which is one of the largest soft costs. Solar app can dramatically bring down the cost of solar in California so that it's in line with the rest of the world. Uh, so this graph is based on data from the International Renewable Energy Agency uh, from 2020. It's the cost of solar for a typical rooftop system, 6KW is like an average size. Um, and as you can see, Solar is more expensive in California than the rest of the world, right? It's double the cost of solar in Germany and Japan, other countries that have completely streamlined permitting and interconnection and inspection. So this graph really shows what we are aiming for. And I, I just, you know, can you imagine how much more solar we would have uh, if it cost half as much? Next slide, please. Uh, we turn some numbers on exactly what cost savings uh, we would see from the wide scale adoption of solar app. Um, and the answer is thousands of dollars in a city or county with typical permitting processes, solar app can lower the cost of solar by $1,200 in a city or county with difficult permitting. Uh, if that system, that solar system comes with a solar battery, which is really important for uh, being a source of clean energy when the sun goes down. In that case, solar app can lower the price tag by $5,100. And there's a long list of the ways solar app reduces the cost of permitting, uh, but at the top of the list are fewer visits to the building department and the job site, uh, standardized and faster processes to put together the permit application. There's no back and forth with the billing department to discuss code requirements and redesign the system and resubmit the permit application. Because with Solar App, if a project isn't up to code, the software automatically issues a correction and the installer can update the project and resubmit in minutes. Um, there's significant permitting delays uh, from traditional permitting when, um, sorry, there's significant permitting delays from traditional permitting that cause rescheduling issues with sending out crews that drives up costs. Um, and then as I, I discussed two slides ago, uh, there are fewer contract cancellations with solar app, which then lowers the cost uh, for all homes to go solar. Next slide, please. And by lowering the cost of solar, more homeowners, especially low income homeowners, become willing to go solar. This is because while many homeowners install solar and storage to protect the environment or to have power when the grid goes down or for their own personal reasons, it, a lot of homeowners go solar for those reasons, but if the economics of solar are not attractive, homeowners won't make the investment. So the uh, 
the lower the initial upfront costs are, the quicker the payback period achieved from lower energy bills and the more attractive the economics are solar are. And as a result, more people become willing to make that investment. And that's what we see on the slide here. We calculated out the increase in homes willing to go solar um, due to solar app based off of cost reductions from the previous slide. And then NREL uh, put out a sensitivity analysis uh, based off of prices. And the, and the ranges you see uh, are due to variations between utilities. Um, and as you can see, in a city or county with the typical solar permitting process, adopting solar app should result in 7% uh, more homes willing to go solar. In a city or county with difficult permitting processes, uh, if, if that permit application is solar in storage, adopting solar app should result in 22 to 25% more homes willing to make that investment. And then these figures are much higher uh, for low income uh, homes uh, whose households are more uh, price sensitive. So I will say these figures are, are very conservative. Um, Patrick mentioned this too. One of the impetuses for solar for creating solar app was San Jose. They built their own per automated permitting system in 2015. That resulted in a six-fold increase in solar permit applications, which is incredibly significant. Uh, so um, from a, in terms of getting solar installed on more roofs, getting more batteries installed on more garages, uh, we are very excited about solar app uh, and the SB 379 and the CalApp program. All right. Well, thank you, Benjamin. That was really, really helpful. I think the data is super helpful for informing people about costs. And that was really, I, I knew California was expensive for solar. I didn't know it was the most expensive, but that also doesn't surprise me in some way. So really, really informative. And uh, we're going to open it up for questions. And I'm going to just go through, just for time's sake, I'm going to go through all the questions that are, are listed in the chat, and we'll, we'll answer them live. And then after that, what we'll do is we'll open, a, open up the floor for people to use the raise hand feature to ask questions live if they want. So we'll start with the ones that have been typed in because they've been waiting a while um, to get their answers and we'll get started with that. So the first question, which we'll answer live, and I think this one is, is directed to Lucio in his presentation, is the Cal app application the only document that has to be submitted. Are there any other documents such as such an such as an authority to, to apply from a city or city council manager? So the uh, application is the only um, required document to be submitted. But if you want to be get ahead of the um, line, you can submit also a payee data record and a CEC contact list that we have. Um, attached to our webpage as well. So, but the application is the only required document at first. Okay, great. And um, the next question is, um, it says, our city building official met with someone from the solar app team previously and determined it was it will not integrate with our permitting system. What recommendations can you provide in terms of our city's compliance? And I'll open the floor up for that one. Who, who wants to take that? I can go for it from the solar app side. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Emily Delecki. Uh, I work at NREL very closely with Patrick, um, who presented on our behalf. Um, and I also work very closely on the solar app project. So if you are to adopt solar app, I'm a, a person you might be working with. 
Um, but to answer the question, at least from the solar app side of things, um, as Patrick mentioned, we have two adoption methods. So one is to integrate with your current permitting system. Um, to do that, it, your system only needs a few requirements, such as allowing a PDF upload, a unique field, and accepting online payments. Um, but for, like, for the person who asked this question, if your system doesn't have those capabilities, we do have the standalone option. Um, and so that is really for jurisdictions who are mostly accepting applications, uh, maybe via email or even still in person. I know some jurisdictions still like the, to have those hard copies. Um, and so the standalone option could probably be the best option for someone in this situation. Um, and that's something that our team would be really happy to work with you on as well. Um, but I'll let anyone else who wants to speak to this question, go ahead. I'll just add that um, when S when SB 379 was going through the legislature, it was really important um, to decision makers that uh, sure, all jurisdictions be able to use solar app. Um, and the standalone version that Emily just outlined is really the way to go because that simply requires an email address, a bank account, um, and then you'll need to tell, communicate some information about your jurisdiction to solar app like snow load and, and um, wind speed. But it's, it's designed, you don't need to have the Rolls Royces of permitting platforms existing, the standalone version uh, should be able to, to, is the method by which you would adopt solar app if you just have a basic system. Great. That's that's. I think that's going to be super helpful. We'll move on to the next question. Um, most of our city's buildings are old, and we have specific structural um, check requirements regarding existing framing size, spacing, and span. Are these able to be checked in the software? That's a great question. Um, we don't check for all of those specific things, but what I will say is um, any system above four pounds per square foot is generally not going to pass through solar app. And actually, I shouldn't say generally. Anything above four pounds per square foot is not going to pass through solar app. That doesn't mean that the system isn't code compliant. Um, it just means that it might need to go through your jurisdiction's traditional review process because we cannot check all of those very specific structural items on every building. Um, but with that four pounds per square foot load, um, what that's doing is replacing a 25 or a 20 pound per square foot live load, meaning can be walked on um, and things like that. So we're replacing that current load, which most buildings will meet without any issue um, with that four pounds or less per square foot. Um, pounds per square foot load. So that's how we address that issue. Um, and if anything is above that weight then it's just going to need to go through your traditional review process to get that more um, specified review. Great. Thanks, Emily. And we'll move on to the next question. Can we add our own permit notes, permit number, and other markups on the plants? Um, that's a great question. So when if you're using the whether you, you're using the integrated or the standalone option, what's going to happen is the installer is going to get a solar app approval ID. Um, they're then going to input if they're using the integrated method, they're going to go right to your system. Let's say um, if you're using like an Acela or Energov, just as an example, they're going to be directed right over there. They're going to input their information. They're going to upload those approval documents, um, and then that information is going to come through your system. So there will be your own permit number that gets assigned. Now, as far as the other components of that, so like the permit notes and other markups, um, that those components aren't necess necessarily going to happen because Solar App is doing all of the compliance checks. So there isn't going to be a human, whether that's on our side or on your side, checking over that permit before it gets issued. However, we do issue a uh, checklist and that's gonna be given to your inspectors to take out in the field. And that's where they are absolutely gonna have the chance to make their own markup. So they're gonna be able to go through that checklist, make sure that everything on the system matches exactly what was input into Solar App. And if anything is either not matching up or if the inspector has notes, they'll absolutely be able to make their markups at that point in the process. 
Um, and I think I covered everything there, but if Patrick wants to add anything else, you know, please feel free to go ahead. <laughs> Great, Thank, thanks, Emily. Uh, next question, how might we extend solar app style permitting to allow easy code compliant heat pump water heater installations replacing gas water heaters in the same location? So people wanna expand this, this sounds exciting, right? So can we do it for other, re other reasons? I I can take a stab at this and, and rough folks can add to it. Um, the Energy Commission recently submitted a grant application to the Federal Department of Energy uh, to expand solar app to include uh, heat pumps, HVAC, um, and other um, and other additions. Um, and the Energy Commission put it in that grant application in partnership with NREL. Um, so hopefully, all fingers crossed, uh, there will be funding um, coming from the federal government to add uh, that uh, functionality to solar app. That's actually, funnily enough, solar app used to just be called solar app. There was no plus sign. If you notice in the presentation, we've added a plus sign uh, to uh, symbolize that it's not just solar, it's other technologies. We've already added um, uh, solar storage, for example, uh, main panel upgrades. Um, so hopefully heat pump water heaters will be coming. Um, and if we do get funding uh, the, to the question asker, uh, we, uh, the Energy Commission and REL will be looking for jurisdictions um, to help build that software with. So I can put my email in the chat. And if you're interested in being a part of that, if funding is secured, uh, we would love to have your involvement. Great. All right, next question. I'm going to try to, we only have 15 minutes left, so. All right, how, if at all, does the new net metered billing impact these potential savings? So the, the NEM, NEM proceeding, it's what everyone's talking about here. Uh, this can be a whole other webinar <laughs> into itself, uh, but in short, uh, in the investor and utilities in, in California, um, the export rate for solar it is being reduced uh, significantly uh, to about five cents a kilowatt hour. Um, this is going to significantly uh, negatively impact um, the potential savings uh, and hurt the economics of solar. And one way to make sure people keep going solar uh, despite this is to lower the initial upfront costs. Uh, to help keep the economics as significant uh, by adopting solar app. Yeah, and, and this is my opportunity to do a plug for LGSCC. We, we, we uh, were part of that proceeding and submitted comments. If you go to our LGSCC webpage, you can see what we've done on that, on those issues. But the cost is definitely an issue when it comes to this. All right, next, next item is how can the standalone version of uh, solar app be hosted, operating systems, et cetera? That's a great question. So um, with the standalone version, not much is really gonna have to change um, from the way you're doing things today. So whatever operating system, or let's say whatever gov government technology software you're using today to keep track of permits, you're gonna keep doing that the exact same way. Um, and how this process is gonna work is, um, when someone goes, an installer goes through solar app, they're going to go through solar app, they're going to submit their application, get their approval documents, make their payment. And once that is all issued, um, both the installer and the jurisdiction are going to get an email with all of that information. So everyone has the most up to date information at all times. So now is where um, a little bit of human work does have to come in. Um, so one of your permit techs can basically take that email take the information they need, and then input that into whatever software you're already using today to keep track of your permits. Um, while this does take a little bit of work from your staff, it's still going to be less work than it would take for your permit tech to say, intake this permit uh, application, review the entire thing, um, may potentially issue corrections that are needed, um, or issue that permit. So it will take a little bit of work from your staff, but still ideally much less than actually reviewing that entire permit application. Great. Thanks, Emily. All right, next question. How would a jurisdiction on email issue a permit without 
even generating the permit. There would be no permit number to issue until it's in the system. Without a, the manpower to process a permit instantly, the system is flawed. They will be issuing a permit without the jurisdiction essentially. Yeah, I understand that question. Absolutely. So um, I think the the gap there that maybe I, I maybe didn't fully uh, explain earlier was just that um, basically when the standalone version, Solar App is actually going to be issuing that permit on the jurisdiction's behalf. So if you have the integrated version, um, the installer is going to be redirected to your system. Like I said earlier, maybe a Sela, maybe Energov, maybe a, a different system of a different name, and your system is going to handle the rest of that portion. However, if you're on standalone, um, Solar App is going to be able to actually fully complete that process for you. So they are going to be able to process the payment through a program called called Stripe. Um, that payment's going to go direct to your jurisdiction's bank account. So Solar App doesn't actually touch your permit fee at any time. It goes direct to your jurisdiction's bank account, and they issue a permit on your behalf. Um, and then again, that email is going to be sent to both the installer and the jurisdiction. So as you, the jurisdiction, you're going to get all of that Solar App approval information, including the Solar App approval ID, um, and then the installer is going to have that permit in their hands. Um, this process looks slightly different for each jurisdiction, just based on the their personal preferences, but this is something our team is more than happy uh, to walk through with you. Okay, great. And we're going to move on to the next one. And it looks like it's David Freeman. I'm going to try to combine your questions there. It looks like he had two questions. And um, it looks like do AHJs that have until nine, let's see, 9-30-24 to adopt solar app need to comply with SB 379 reporting requirements beginning June 30th, 2024 or 2025? That's the first question he had. Yes, uh, so I believe uh, with that, uh, we would ask them to submit reporting for the partial year of the, between um, 9-30-2024 to 12-31-2024. And then they will submit a full year after that, I believe. They will submit that require the reporting to us between they have six months to uh, submit the reporting uh, to us. So they have until June of the 30th, 2025 to submit that um, partial year uh, reporting uh, requirements. Okay, and the other question is, is the electric service um, looks like provider in the IOU or POU or a CCA if the AHJ is served by a CCA? And acronyms, oh. community choice aggregators, investor owned yeah. utility. <laughs> yeah, so people understand. So, um, I don't, this question, I, David, if you could clarify um, the connection between your question on solar app, that would be appreciated. But um, for CCA, if an AHJ is served by a CCA, the electricity is supplied for by the CCA and the IOU is um, is delivering the electricity. But I don't think that answers your question because it has nothing to do with solar app. I, I will say that um, utilities take, uh, in order for interconnection, they require uh, the solar app approval documents. Um, so, so there's a solar app is set up to generate documents that then can be given to the, to the utilities for interconnection. And I realize I could not put my email address in the chat. It's just Ben, B-E-N at CALSA, C-A-L-S-S-A dot org. Sorry. Great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, the other question is from Kurt. Uh, does the standalone option have the capability to generate annual reports for PV permits issues, PV plus e ESS permits issued? You know, that's yeah. actually a great question. I haven't worked too much with that side of things. Um, Patrick, I'm curious if maybe you're more educated on that end of the things than I am. Um, I don't believe right now that we do have the ability to to create reports like that. Um, however, that is something that I we know is part of the 
the reporting requirements, and that's something that we're working on trying to integrate into solar app um, for jurisdictions going forward to be able to easily export it and have the reports that they need uh, for um, SB 379 uh, reporting. So that's not something that's currently in solar app, but that's something definitely we are um, hope to in implement in the near future. So. And what I will say is that all of the permits issued for your jurisdiction, that information absolutely is in within solar app. So you'll be able to access any of that information at any time. I'm just personally less familiar with what the report side of that looks like. So thanks, Patrick, for filling in there. Yeah, and Kurt, it looks like you had a follow up question. Did you want to you can come off mute or I can I can ask the question live. It's up to you. Um, but his question is, is that there he is? Yeah, let's. Sure. Um, thank you so much. Um, sorry for the typos. So uh, my second question is, um, the say the person at, in the uh, jurisdiction, um, do they have to report to the load serving entity, the electric utility monthly or annually? I mean, some of these applications, I would imagine it's going to have to be no less than bi-monthly to not hold up interconnection. And is, the, are the, are the, is there a legal obligation and under what you know under what obligation is the uh, government agency that's ge that generates the permits through solar app plus obliged to to forward the permit approval information to the load serving entity Kurt, I believe the answer to your question is that the solar installer will have the approval documents and they can provide that to the load serving entity for interconnection. Well, thank you. Great. And, and David Friedman, I'd like to have you um, jump in too. It looks like you had a lot of questions. I want to make sure you get all your questions answered too. There was some confusion. So if you're available. Um, you could unmute yourself. That would be great. Um, but he was asking about what entity should be listed in, in Q6 of the data collection field. Yeah, so for the electric utility service provider, um, that should be um, the IOU, I believe. But these are uh, just, as a reminder, these are just uh, proposed data collections um, reports that were. Um, still going through in our internal process for the uh, guidelines. So uh, right now that's part of it, but it may or may not be one of the final um, fields for collection. And Gabby says it looks like there was a question in the chat that came up. Um, has there been consideration to expand the platform to include electric utilities that are not municipalities to streamline the interconnection process at both the building department and the, the electric utilities? Great question. I was going to ask Absolutely that. a great question. <laughs> um, and interconnection actually absolutely is on our product roadmap. Um, and, you know, it's something that we actually get asked very frequently. Um, as I'm sure you, everyone on this call is aware, interconnection is another uh, can be another bottleneck. Um, so that's absolutely something that's in our product roadmap. And anyone else on the panel, feel free to plug in there too. I don't have anything to add, but I, I wanted to say for folks that want um, to be to begin registering to use Solar App, I, I wanted to share the email address, which is solarapp.nrel.gov slash register and once you begin registering you'll be in emily and and patrick correct me if i'm wrong there'll be an nrel system and nrel will then reach out to you to assist with onboarding um, so that's how how to how to get registered and then i was hoping lucio you could provide a link for cal app for folks to register for cal app too yeah, they can uh, send any um, questions to our email at calapp at energy.ca.gov. And I'll just confirm what you said, Ben. Yeah, as soon as you register, someone from the Solar App team is going to reach out to you. 
Um, and we host, we call them onboarding office hours every two weeks. So, um, you know, if the registration process or something with onboarding is tripping you up a bit, you know, our team is there to help you through that process. So um, we're, we're, we're happy to help you out and, uh, you know, we're excited to have more folks registering. Yeah, we appreciate everyone who attended um, this today. And Gabby, I did want to confirm we're going to have a, or you'll email um, a, the presentation or recording of this with all the, um, also with some of the, the links and information as well as part of that uh, to everyone that attended. Um, and I think um, we really appreciate uh, your time and um, appreciate um, everyone being here today. Hopefully this was informative and, and wish you the best and uh, take care. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Yes, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.